And I want you to be grateful that you're going through this sad moment with all these other folks. Because I promise you, there is something worse out there than being sad, and that is being alone and being sad. Ain't nobody in this room alone. Ted Lasso is such a bizarre show, incredibly groundbreaking in all sorts of ways I never expected, and yet it's also somehow the most ordinary, familiar show imaginable. Which is a bit odd to be so refreshingly unique and yet feel so familiar that you barely notice just how unique it is. Ted Lasso is a deeply heartfelt comedy series about an American NFL coach who gets hired as a British football manager for a fictional Premier League side named Richmond. A premise I assumed to be a dumb gimmick, particularly when you remember those old promo clips from years ago, but there's huge substance behind this show. So much I want to make several videos about this, if people are interested. Uh, one speaking as a therapist where I break down all the therapy scenes in the show, one analysing the character Nate and one talking about the show as a whole. Um, today though I'm just going to focus on one specific thing about Ted Lasso masculinity, because this show does such a good job there that it starts to make other shows and films look quite flawed in comparison. Shut up Thierry Henry. Let's start with a short and hopefully obvious point about masculinity though. Uh, the thing about masculinity is that our culture's views of it are often skewed by the idea of the alpha and the beta. Either you're an alpha male who is tough, who takes what he needs, is constantly on top as a hero, is always required or at least places himself in a role as always required to fix things as a hero to others either physically able to fight off threats to his power and status or verbally. By verbally, imagine whatever Marvel heroes who show constant fearlessness and deflect against anything that might undermine them through endless quips and one-liners and outwitting other people to sometimes mad extremes in those films. Either that or you're a beta man who is deemed shy, not confident enough to take what he wants, uh, sensitivity becomes seen as submissive and weak, you're one of the other of those two examples and it's dangerous because as society continues to progress or hopefully progress and the importance for everyone at times to you know show some sensitivity express feeling and empathy as part of functioning healthily there is a portion of men that feel threatened by this that mistake the idea of sensitivity and empathy as being this beta stereotype that they're in some way being asked to become what they deem to be weak and submissive therefore they they push back against this idea as a threat when in reality sensitivity and empathy don't have to have anything at all to do with submissiveness or weakness. Done right, not only can a healthy, emotionally open man still feel strong, but that his emotional availability can actually further empower him. A point the show Ted Lasso understands incredibly well. How so? Um, let's start by talking about Roy Kent. You play like that next week, you can kiss the trophy goodbye, because today, you will play like a bunch of little pricks! You hear me? On the surface, I think Roy Kent appears to be the typical alpha male stereotype. He shouts, he constantly swears. Fuck! Fuck! Fuck no! Fucking Nate! He's an incredibly physical and aggressive player on the pitch. He's a leader. He can intimidate people with a stare and a growl, and he appears to praise Nate's violence towards a window. That was fucking embarrassing! Oh, I am equally livid. Oh my god. Roy is all of these things, and the way he channels his aggression into his football does improve his performances. Your speed and your smarts were never what made you who you are. It's your anger. That's your superpower. I mean, you used to run like you were angry at the grass. There's two points to make, however. The first is that whilst all of this is true, not once in the show is Roy Ken ever violent to anyone. Whilst he has a commanding presence, he is never domineering or belittling towards others. He regularly expresses his emotion honestly and with confidence. He is regularly thoughtful towards others. He has the maturity to apologise, to forgive and to try to communicate 
better. One good example being his relationship to Keely. The two start to grow fond of each other. One evening he walks her home and kisses her, but then suddenly walks off. When Keely tries organising to meet up or just texting to talk the next day, and her every attempt is met with Rory saying he's busy to the extent she doubts he is into her. But then when Rory does find free time, he has the openness to admit he's nervous to take things too quick because he cares about her a lot. I'm trying to do this differently. I should have told you that. I apologise. And I am trying to be more honest. And Keely, who was confused and hurt by him kind of ghosting her, then admits that she slept with Jamie the previous night. I didn't think you were into me. I didn't know what you wanted and I knew exactly what he wanted. To which Roy is angry but takes none of it out on her. More so, she has apologised, they aren't in any kind of relationship at this point, so despite a moment of anger, he forgives and they move on. Which, whilst not always perfect, is healthy masculinity, I think. Open enough to try and explain his feelings and communicate what's behind his behaviour, understanding enough to try and make sense of Keeley's behaviour, mature enough to move on from it. Also, as a side note, this is point one on what I think is groundbreaking about this show. It takes conflicts between people like you ordinarily get in TV, but instead of always building the conflict up into something massive and dramatic for the sake of entertainment, you get many moments of people just maturely resolving the conflicts as people should do in reality. Not only is that healthier, but even from an entertainment point of view, it's engaging because you don't expect it. We're so conditioned in TV to expect mass drama to come out of every dilemma that to just see two people nip it in the bud very sensibly, <laughs> you go, oh, okay, good. That was a nice surprise. It makes the show very unpredictable in a way that doesn't feel forced, I think. Anyway, uh, the other thing about Roy Kent is that his very macho side is regularly undermined and kind of played for laughs, yet never actually criticised as a bad thing. We get Keeley very early on mocking him. I'm Roy Kent, and I get paid to play a game, but I'm mad all the time. <sighs> or showing how easily he can be wound up. No, I couldn't, Keeley, because... No, Keeley, you had Keely, if you would listen to I'm me, just to listen, listen to you. I could tell you why. So tell me. There's people constantly making jokes about how angry Roy is in a way that kind of ridicules it, and then also the many examples, I guess, of putting Mr. Stereotypical Macho Man in unmatro situations, particularly with his niece Phoebe, such as Ted giving Roy the book A Wrinkle in Time as a present and Roy finding it a bit ridiculous, only to discover when reading it to Phoebe that he loves the book, which kind of then starts him on a journey of developing a passion for reading, more obviously playing Princess and the Dragon with Phoebe. Can I be the dragon this time? No. Fine. But you better fix the one. Going to doll shops or consoling her about feeling embarrassed by telling her the embarrassing story of him shitting himself three weeks ago. You pooped your pants. Roy Kent. Yeah. So? I do too sometimes. The thing about all these situations of undermining Roy Kent's macho-ness is that none of it is a a problem in any way, or be depicted as weird scenarios. You know, does Roy Kent feel any less of a man because he's playing girly games with his niece? Of course he doesn't. Is reading a very good novel any sort of threat to his tough man status? Definitely not. And you know, the confidence with which he admits to being a grown man who shat himself after eating a ton of ice cream despite knowing he's bad with dairy. Yeah. So? I hope the point I'm moving towards is becoming clear. It doesn't matter whatsoever that Roy's macho side sometimes gets undermined, often for laughs, because he's secure enough to allow himself to be undermined without it being a threat to his masculinity. He's secure enough in who he is to not need to appear macho all the time. He does still sometimes, yes, it's part of his character, it's probably part of his role as a team captain, there's nothing wrong in that. But it's not all of his character, nor does he need to feel chained by it, nor weak when he doesn't fit it. Roy Ken can feel strong and confident even when he's ridiculed, or when he's emotionally vulnerable, or when he needs to ask others for relationship advice. It's not always pleasant when others easily mock him for his angry persona, no, but he feels no need either to outwit them in response or to vent his aggression in order to reassert himself. And it's not always pleasant to be emotionally vulnerable, sometimes that 
does make you feel weak. I mean, of course, being vulnerable can be very hard, but to be so hard and make you feel so weak as to shut down all the vulnerability entirely, that isn't Roy. And whilst he isn't perfect, he's a pretty healthy person as a result. But let's move on now and discuss the character of Jamie Tart. It doesn't matter what you say, because in my head, I'm just here in the crowd cheer my name after I scored a goal tonight. Jamie Todd isn't exactly the nicest of men, <laughs> but I think he is in many ways what a younger Roy Kent might have been. He's incredibly talented and full of himself as a result, and while less physical than Roy, he's verbally very gobby and keen to dominate bully and belittle others. If he is ridiculed or undermined in any way, he's keen to reassert himself in order to save face as though to be seen as anything other than on top in any situation is a threat to him. But then you remember he's just a kid. For all his arrogance and refusal to work with the team, his open rudeness and rebellion against Ted, Ted pulls him into his office and tells him, I can honestly say you are the best athlete I have ever coached. And you see such visible delight slowly creeping onto Jamie's face as you realise all of the bravado is partly just bravado and that he's still just a kid trying to hide his insecurity. Ted says he's truly great at everything he does except for one thing. My left foot cross. Expecting to be criticised in the same way he internally criticises himself. Suddenly they've melted through all of it. Suddenly this man Ted he has no respect for is now like a father figure in a matter of seconds and Ted explains that the one thing is that that Jamie forgets he's a team player, and that if he could get better at that, he could be a superstar. Brilliant writing, by the way. Two characters have conflict. Not only does it not build into drama, but Ted solves it without arguments or fights or even the classic TV formula of one-upping Jamie in some sort of way. Instead, just speaking to his heart and his insecurity in an empathetic manner. Not that this interaction does entirely resolve their conflict, because Jamie still has a long way to go to develop as a person, but this is the start of it. And through a mixture of many different occurrences, he does get there. He stops belittling others to prop up his own ego, he starts working with them, supporting them, he becomes more able to express his vulnerability, particularly to Keeley. He shows the willingness to ask Roy for help with mentoring, even though asking for his help makes him feel a bit small. He learns to take accountability, to apologise, and we also get the wonderfully painful confrontation with his dad, a pretty horrible man who makes it exactly clear where Jamie's insecurities stem from. But here, despite his intimidating faux friendliness, Jamie stands up to him. Rather him not. Yeah, they just want to look around it, only take a second. <laughs> I'd rather him not. Don't speak to me. Like that. Uh -huh. Don't speak to me like that. Uh -huh. Don't speak to uh, me like that. Uh. When Jamie is standing firm, his dad can't take it and tries to draw him into a fight, to which Jamie does punch him. His dad then gets pulled away and removed, but Jamie is left there in shock. Roy moves forwards to hug him, and Jamie cries. This is quite possibly my favourite scene in the entire show. Kieran O'Brien, who plays Jamie's dad, does a fantastic job with such a tragically real character. You so easily recognise all of the mannerisms in similar real life people. But the point of me bringing up this scene though is that it's in Jamie's growth as a person to someone more emotionally open that he becomes much more able to stand up to his dad compared to previous scenes such as this or in that he could previously only manage breaking free from his father by actively sabotaging his own career. Here however he's resolute within himself because he's more confident within as a person now, less chained to the insecurity and more separated from what his dad thinks of him. And whilst it is a shame he has to resort to violence, it's a huge positive that he doesn't back down to the man who has always made him feel small. In general then, it's in being comfortable enough to show weakness to others that he's actually become stronger within. I like also that punching his dad isn't played like some triumphant one-upping moment where the bully gets their just desserts and we all have a laugh at his expense. You know, we don't hail Jamie for this great show of strength. Much more realistically and very maturely of the writers, it's both a positive to stand up to him, but also incredibly tragic and sad to be in a position where you are punching your dad. Of course Jamie cries. Of course he needs to be hugged right now, the shock of all of this. This is a sad moment, and it is, again, Jamie's growing strength that he can let himself be sad without feeling shame at the emotion. 
And also the true mark of a great leader with Rory going to hug him. Being a leader isn't about making people follow your commands so much as it's about looking out for those people so much so that they choose to follow your command. And in a way that's what being sensitive means, being receptive to other people's feelings rather than dismissive towards them. That's and being receptive to your own. This is point two on what I find groundbreaking about Ted Lasso. Not playing physical violence as a moment of triumph, not technically criticising it in this specific example, but certainly not glorifying it. You know, I wanted to talk also about the masculinity of Ted himself. I wanted to talk about Rebecca and Keely and how, funnily enough, solid, healthy femininity shows many of the same traits. I wanted to talk about Nate too, however I think I'll save him for a specific video all about Nate. Perhaps also a video about characters who don't show such healthy masculinity such as Rupert and Jamie's dad because whilst Jamie is given what he needs to grow, that being therapy here, sometimes a strong word, a healthy environment, a big thing I think actually is uh, Keely telling him being accountable matters Jamie and breaking up with him I think he needed that as much as Keely did uh, whilst Jamie is given all of that it wouldn't be anywhere near as simple with Rupert that would need its own video though today I'm going to make one more point and hopefully tie all of this together The point I started with was that sensitivity and empathy, when confident with them, need not make you feel weaker but actually empower you. And what we get in Ted Lasso is a show primarily about footballers, people who are stereotypically seen as big, laddish, brutish, macho, as sometimes like robots who just perform because they have a fun job and massive wages, therefore aren't somehow entitled to struggle with ordinary human mental health issues. Which reminds me actually of Andrew being seen by his father as a racehorse in the film The Breakfast Club. You can check out my video on him. Believe it or not, not only are footballers human who feel things, who struggle with the extreme pressures of the job, Roy Kent shuts himself away in the dark, in a wheelie bin of icy water watching pundits on live TV talking about how he scored an own goal because he feels such deep shame about the mistake. You just tell me I fucked up and then go. Not gonna do that, bud. I lost is the game. I'm a piece of shit. Ted Lasso himself gives us a wonderfully realistic depiction of panic attacks, which actually remind me of the sobering, sort of related fact that nearly half of all football managers suffer significant heart problems due to the extreme stress and pressure of the job. Which is pretty mad. Um, either way, I think there's something quite brilliant about taking a group of people who are often stigmatised as brutish hard men who don't feel things and showing us not only in fact, yes, they actually do feel, but also the modern footballer, even when he looks like Roy Kent, has much more to him than that. He has to because this is a sport about working as a team and that requires a healthy environment where people can function at their best, not just physically but mentally too. One of the small touches I quite like is Sam Obasanya. Whenever he has a phone call with his dad, he often refers to him as daddy, Hello, daddy. and tells him he loves him. And nothing at all is made out of this. That's my third, fourth point on what makes this show groundbreaking. Many moments where men do show sides like this that don't fit into media's typical, less healthy depiction of a man, and the show makes absolutely no point about it whatsoever. Just slips this in as the most ordinary thing in the world, which very much normalises it. You know, there's no chance admittedly of me ever calling my dad daddy because of the connotations I feel it carries, but why don't I ever tell him I love him? I very rarely say that, even though it's true, it should be an ordinary thing to say and just goes to show how stupid I can sometimes be. None of this makes them any weaker as people, none of this damages their ability to show that firmness, that resoluteness that is also sometimes required. As much as we need to be sensitive and thoughtful and empathetic, sometimes we do need to stand resolute or to stand up for others. Hopefully not very often, but sometimes people do need a bit of bite to them. I'm talking about practice! And you can't do it, because you're hurt. And in the context here of a physical competitive game, to shout and get fired up and be a little bit kind of primal, that need not be anything toxic. I mean, it definitely can be, but not if done right. That 
firmness need not be in any contradiction to sensitivity. Which is where Ted comes in, the man who is consistently receptive to feelings in a way that spreads to the others. He helps the team to balance the two, the firmness and sensitivity. He works to gradually form a healthier, less toxic atmosphere in the squad, one where sensitivity does not undermine strength but comes to empower it further, including for himself. That's basically what this show is about, how working with our feelings can empower us to be better more confident, stronger, happier people. As a counsellor, I 100% agree. That's all I'll say on this wonderful show for now. Please let me know if you're keen for more videos on Ted Lasso, I could honestly make tons of them with how I feel at the moment. Like the video, comment your thoughts, what I got wrong, what you can add to, subscribe if you want to stick around, support me on Patreon if you want to help me keep this channel going, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you guys to Janice McMahon, Luke Hoare, Tree True Caber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Dustin Paulson, Brian Herring, Samara Salsi, Sharrock 2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, Incomplete Sentience, and Nicholas Patrick. Thank you.